At around 10 a.m. on the 15th of January in 1947, Betty Bersinger and her daughter left home to get some shoes repaired at a local shop. The shop wasn't far away, so they decided to walk, and on their journey, Betty noticed something on the side of the road. At first, she thought it might have been an abandoned mannequin because of the positioning of the body. But on closer inspection, Betty realised that she had just stumbled upon something that would haunt her for the rest of her life. There, lying on the grass, was the dead body of a naked young woman. She had been sliced in two and drained of all of her blood, leaving her skin a pale white. Lying on her back, her hands had been positioned over her head with her arms bent and legs spread. Chunks of flesh, including her breasts, had been cut off and several of her organs had been removed. A tattoo from her upper thigh had been cut off and placed inside her vagina alongside some of her hair and most chilling of all were the lacerations across her face. Deep gashes slicing from the corner of her mouth to a point almost at her ears formed a disturbing, wide smile. Betty was absolutely horrified. She grabbed her daughter and ran straight to a nearby house to phone the police. When they arrived, they took fingerprints and sent them to the FBI, who soon identified the body as that of 22-year-old Elizabeth Short. The gruesome nature of the discovery made the case infamous, with movies and TV programs made about the case for decades after her death. However, despite all the media coverage the case has received, it remains an unsolved mystery to this day. Today, we're looking at the case of Elizabeth Short, the woman who came to be known as the Black Dahlia. Elizabeth Short was born on the 29th of July, 1924, in Boston, Massachusetts, to Cleo Short and Phoebe Sawyer. Her father lost most of his savings in the 1929 stock market crash, and a year later, when Elizabeth was just five years old, his car was found abandoned on the Charlestown Bridge. It was assumed that he had jumped into the Charles River, and for many years, the family presumed him to be dead. Thirteen years later, however, he sent a letter to Phoebe, Elizabeth's mum, stating that he was still alive and apologising for leaving the way he did. Although Phoebe wanted nothing more to do with him, Elizabeth rekindled her relationship with him. A year later, after Elizabeth turned 19, she decided to go and stay with him in California, but the living arrangements didn't last long. He complained that Elizabeth was too messy, wasn't doing anything with her life, and was seeing too many men. As a result, he soon kicked her out. By this point, Elizabeth had developed a passion for film, and so she began moving from place to place, working as a waitress whilst aspiring to become an actress. During this period, she lived with a number of different people and developed a reputation for being flirtatious, often staying with men that she was seeing casually. In the six months before her death, she lived in Southern California, predominantly in LA. Her final few days were spent in San Diego with a man named Robert Manley, a 25-year-old married salesman who she had been dating. On the 9th of January 1947, Manley drove Elizabeth from San Diego back to Los Angeles, dropping her off at the Biltmore Hotel. Several hotel staff recalled seeing Elizabeth using the telephone in the hotel lobby, and shortly after, she was sighted by patrons of Crown Grill Cocktail Lounge, just over half a kilometre away from the Biltmore. This was the last time she was ever seen alive, and six days later, Betty Bersinger would discover her dead body. As soon as the disturbing scene was uncovered, investigations began. Police quickly ruled that this was a sophisticated killing, likely committed by someone with surgical skills due to the precision of Elizabeth's injuries and due to the fact that there was no trauma to any of her bones or internal organs. It was also clear that whoever had killed Elizabeth had a clear and detailed understanding of anatomy, and as a result, police interviewed several students from the University of Southern California Medical School, but their efforts were unfruitful. An autopsy was conducted the day after her body was discovered, which revealed further details about the crime. It was concluded from the findings that Elizabeth had likely died at some point between the evening of the 14th and the early hours of the 15th, with the cause of death likely being hemorrhaging from the lacerations on her face and shock from the trauma inflicted upon her head. Marks on her legs, wrists, and neck suggested that she had been bound and tortured, and it was also determined that the cuts to her face, which were around three inches long, had been made while she was still alive. 
It was also noted that Elizabeth's anal canal was dilated, which suggests that she might have been raped. Furthermore, it was determined that her body had been cut in half by a technique taught in the 1930s called a hemicorporectomy, and the lack of bruising along the incision line suggested that it had been performed after death. Shortly after, fingerprints which had been sent to the FBI were matched to the fingerprints that were on her file from an arrest for an underage drinking charge in 1943. So, investigators got to work on establishing Elizabeth's whereabouts in the days leading up to the discovery of her body. Due to the horrendous nature of the crime, the case received widespread media coverage. The name Black Dahlia was reportedly given to Elizabeth as a wordplay on the film The Blue Dahlia, a crime film which features a promiscuous and unfaithful woman named Helen, adapted to reflect Elizabeth's affinity for sheer black clothes. In addition to other outlets, the Los Angeles Examiner covered the case, pleading with the public for information surrounding Elizabeth's death. Due to the gruesome nature of her death, the case received enormous traction and the newspaper was inundated with tips, but the majority of them came up short until nine days after the discovery of Elizabeth's body, the Los Angeles Examiner received a letter. The letter was addressed to the publication and was written using a variety of newspaper and magazine clippings, presumably so that the sender's handwriting could not be examined. The letter reads, here is Dahlia's belongings, letter to follow. Sure enough, enclosed with the letter were Elizabeth's social security card, her birth certificate, several photographs, and Elizabeth's address book, which had had several pages torn out. The letter and its contents had also been rubbed with gasoline to remove any trace of fingerprints. Police contacted around 75 men that were named in her address book, but the majority of them said that they had only met her briefly and all were eventually ruled out. Over the course of the investigation, a further 12 letters were sent to the LA Examiner. Most followed the same style as the first letter, with newspaper and magazine clippings used to convey written messages, and most were signed off with the Black Dahlia Avenger. The fact that the sender was using the term Avenger, which is someone who inflicts harm or punishment upon someone in return for an injury or a wrong, led the police to conclude that this was likely a revenge crime committed by someone known to Elizabeth. All of the letters that had been sent had been rubbed in gasoline, except for one. The police thought that the killer might have become sloppy and rushed to identify the prints found on it, but unfortunately they were unable to match them to any found on file. One of the letters was a handwritten note suggesting that their search was about to come to an end, reading, Here it is, turning in Wednesday, January 29th at 10am. Had my fun at police. Black Dahlia Avenger. However, despite the police waiting, no killer came forward to turn themselves in, and on the day they were due to, they received another letter which read, Have changed my mind. You would not give me a square deal. Dahlia killing was justified. Whether any of these 12 additional letters were actually genuine is a matter open to debate, but it is thought that at least several of them were indeed sent by Elizabeth's true killer. As the last known person to have spent time with Elizabeth, Robert Manley became the first suspect. In fact, he was the only person to ever be arrested in connection with this case. He was placed under intense investigation and was even paraded in front of the press in handcuffs. However, with sightings of Elizabeth after the time and near to the place he claims to have dropped her off six days before her body was discovered, suspicions dampened. Furthermore, he had a solid alibi for his whereabouts on the 14th and 15th of January. Interestingly, seven years later, Manley was administered with sodium pentothal, commonly referred to as truth serum, and once more questioned on the case. But once again, he passed with ease. In the same year, Manley suffered a mental breakdown and began hallucinating. As a result, he was admitted to Patton State Mental Hospital in San Bernardino, California. After an accidental fall in his home in California, Manley died on the 9th of January, 1986, 39 years to the day since he last saw Elizabeth alive. The second suspect in investigations was a man called Mark Hansen. Hansen was a businessman who owned several theatres, two boarding houses, and a nightclub on Hollywood Boulevard. He had a reputation for being a hedonistic ladies' man, frequently attending sex parties, and only hiring attractive women to work at his club. His name had been embossed on the front of the address book that had been sent in by the Black Dahlia Avenger, and as a result, he was one of the first people that police interviewed. 
As we touched on earlier, due to the nature of the crime, police suspected that Elizabeth's killer had been known to her, and upon further investigation, it turned out that not only did Hansen know Elizabeth, but she had actually stayed with him prior to her death. Furthermore, it turned out that he had studied at a medical school in Sweden, which could account for the meticulous medical procedures conducted during the crime, and he also had several romantic advances turned down by Elizabeth, which provided a possible motive. However, it seemed to the investigators highly unlikely that he would have sent an address book linking his name to the crime if he really were the true killer. Eventually, Hansen too was cleared of any suspicion. A third suspect, Patrick O'Reilly, was thought to have known Elizabeth through Mark Hansen. O'Reilly frequented the nightclub owned by Hansen and was considered to be good friends with him. He also in particular stood out to police due to his history of violence against women. He actually already had a conviction for assault with a deadly weapon for taking his secretary to a hotel and beating her for what he describes as no other reason than to satisfy his own sexual desires. Furthermore, he was a qualified medical doctor, which police believe was significant due to the surgical precision of Elizabeth's dissection. Ultimately, however, there was no sufficient evidence linking O'Reilly to Elizabeth's murder, and he too was never charged with a crime related to the killing. A fourth suspect in the investigations was an army corporal named Joseph DeMay. He claimed to have been out drinking with Elizabeth in San Diego a few days prior to her death, and astonishingly, claimed that he was so blackout drunk that it was possible that he was the killer. However, further investigations proved that he was at his military base when the murders took place. DeMay's statement was actually just one of around 60 confessions made to police, but as with his, all were eventually dismissed as false. The fifth and arguably most significant suspect in this case is a man named George Hodel. He ran LA County's venereal disease clinic and studied surgery at medical school in the 1930s when the procedure used to cut Elizabeth in half was being taught. He was wealthy and described as a well-connected, dashing man with a high IQ. He was also the father of 11 children from five different women. Amazingly, perhaps the strongest advocate for suggesting that George was responsible for killing Elizabeth is his own son, Steve Hodel. At the time of the murder, Steve was just five years old. When he grew up, he joined the LAPD and worked for 17 years as a police investigator. After retiring, he became absolutely convinced that his father was the murderer. From that point on, he dedicated his time to writing a book titled Black Dahlia Avenger, consolidating evidence indicating his father's guilt. On the morning of January 15th, eyewitnesses described seeing a black car near the vacant lot just hours before Elizabeth's body was discovered. According to Steve, his father drove a black 1936 Packard at the time, and descriptions of the car matched his father's. Furthermore, Steve believed that his father's handwriting was similar to that of the handwritten note sent by the Black Dahlia Avenger. He had a handwriting sample reviewed by experts, but received mixed results, ranging from probable match to inconclusive. Steve also feels that his father was hiding many things from both his family and the public eye, claiming that he had a secret room in their family home, which no one was allowed to enter. After George's death in 1999, Steve investigated his belongings. There, he found photos of an unknown woman who he believed to be Elizabeth Short. Steve hired a forensic artist to examine the photograph, but they concluded that they were 85% certain that it was not Elizabeth in the photograph. However, in 2014, Steve had the photograph re-examined, this time by an expert using facial recognition technology. According to Steve, the expert concluded that there was a 90 to 95% positive match between the woman in the photograph and Elizabeth Short. Steve concludes from this that suspicions that George and Elizabeth knew each other are correct. Furthermore, in 2013, Steve revisited the family home with cadaver dogs, which indicated the presence of a dead body. A soil sample was taken from the alley behind the house, and tests confirmed the detection of human remains. The test, however, was so inaccurate that it could only conclude that the remains were somewhere between 20 and 100 years old. Initially, George wasn't actually a prime suspect in the case, but he was thrown into the limelight two years after the murder when his daughter Tamar accused him of incestuous sexual abuse and impregnating her. During the trial, Tamar described George's attempts at performing a home abortion on her after finding out that she was pregnant 
and described how she ran away to a nearby house to phone the police. Tamar also recounted several parties that her father hosted where Hollywood stars came and attended. One person in particular, a surrealist artist called Ray Mann, who her father apparently idolised, attended many of them. According to Tamar, her father would force her to pose naked for Ray Mann to photograph. She also alleges that her father taught her about oral sex at age just 11, and by age 14, he was offering her to his friends for sexual intercourse. After a widely publicised trial, however, George was acquitted. Tamir, however, believes that this support was given in the financial interests of the family. A year later, the LAPD planted surveillance devices in George's home, listening to his private conversations for a total of 40 days. Whilst the raw footage no longer exists, the transcripts can be located. He's on record for having said, Supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia, they can't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary anymore because she's dead. They thought there was something fishy. Anyway, now they may have figured it out. Killed her. Maybe I did kill my secretary. The secretary who he's referring to is Ruth Spaulding, who died in 1945. Suspiciously, before calling the police, George burnt many of her belongings. He was actually investigated in relation to her death, but due to a lack of evidence, the charges were dropped and her death was ruled an accidental suicide by overdose. It's believed by some that Spaulding was blackmailing George over the fact that he was carrying out abortions in his clinic, which was a criminal offence in the 1940s. In addition to this, George is also on tape saying, this is the best payoff I've seen between law enforcement agencies and I'd like to get a connection. The LAPD were notoriously corrupt in the 1940s and many believe that this is evidence that George had bribed the LAPD to cover up his involvement in Elizabeth's murder. In 1950, George sold the family house and moved to the Philippines. Many suspect that George was worried that the police were closing in on him, so he fled the country. Public interest in the Black Dahlia case died down and there were no new leads to follow, but in 1967, a body was found with striking similarities to the Black Dahlia in the Philippines. On the 29th of May, the mutilated body of a woman named Lucilla Lalu was discovered in Manila the country's capital city. Her legs were found wrapped in a newspaper, and the following day, her torso was found on a vacant lot with her hands tied behind her back. Her head, however, was never found. Disturbingly, according to Steve, George lived just half a kilometre away from where the body was found at the time. George, however, was never charged with any murder, and he remained in the Philippines until 1990 and passed away nine years later aged 91 in California. Over the years, Steve has collected a wealth of evidence against George, but many criticise his efforts, and many believe that he simply has a personal vendetta against his father. Regardless, Steve continues to investigate him to this day, and he even runs a blog post where he continues to post regular updates to those following the case. Following his father's passing, however, it's likely his suspicions will never be confirmed. For me, I believe that the spreading of Elizabeth's legs, the desecration of her sexual body parts, and the self-given title of the alleged perpetrator, including the word Avenger, strongly suggest that this was an act of revenge for what the killer believed to be a wrongdoing of a sexual nature. George certainly seems like a reasonable suspect, and given Elizabeth's tendency to lead men on but leave them hanging dry, the culprit being an entitled, jealous degenerate that had previous relations with her is certainly a strong possibility. But I personally am also curious about whether the wife of Robert Manley, the man who was allegedly having an affair with Elizabeth at the time of her killing, was ever investigated. Perhaps she could have sought abhorrent revenge upon the woman with whom her husband was wronging her. Nevertheless, as the plaque placed in her memory states, the slaying of Medford's Black Dahlia continues to remain a mystery. Let me know in the comments down below if you have any theories or if there's any information that we missed out in this video. If you enjoyed today's episode, please feel free to subscribe down below. Bye for now.